Now, we're going to bring you a great guest. Uh, we're going to talk to Jacob Weisberg. He's the editor of Slate, and he's written a fascinating uh, story about Peter Thiel. I'm going to tell you who that is in a second. First, Jacob, uh, welcome to the Young Turks. Thank you. All right. Glad to be with you. Great to have you here. Um, so first, let's set this up. Who's Peter Thiel? Um, Peter Thiel is a entrepreneur. He was one of the original invest, one of the founders of PayPal. Um, you know, the thing you use to pay when you buy stuff on eBay. And he made a lot of money on that. And then he's invested as a venture capitalist in a lot of other tech companies. And he was smart enough, or lucky enough, or some combination, to be the original outside investor of Facebook, which has made him a billionaire if he wasn't already. And uh, he's a very smart Silicon Valley guy who typifies an extreme version of what I would call the hyper-libertarian political profile of some of Silicon Valley. These uh, kind of people think that really there is no role for government whatsoever. And uh, in Thiel's case, it goes to a kind of extreme where they're so utopian that they're interested in, in setting up these kind of... Uh, anarchist kind of communes at sea or in outer space, or they have this sort of fantasy of living without any government whatsoever. And uh, it's not exactly Republican. It's certainly not Democratic. Um, it's a political profile which is really, well, we, you know, I think most people understand what libertarians are. Uh, they believe in uh, total personal freedom. Um, but Thiel has, has started uh, putting his money where his mouth is as a philanthropist and has been giving money to causes like this sort of seasteading and outer space exploration. exploration. And most recently, he has founded this scholarship, this fellowship, it's kind of an anti-scholarship, for people to drop out of college to start tech companies. And he will give 20 kids a year $100,000 cash money with the proviso that they have to drop out of school or stop out of school to pursue their tech dreams, a la Mark Zuckerberg or Facebook or Bill Gates. And he thinks we're suffering from a deficiency of uh, people willing to pursue this kind of opportunity. He's very hostile to higher education as an institution in general. Yeah. And uh, anyway, I, I'm, I'm pretty critical of this idea. I mean, I'm certainly critical of this sort of extreme libertarian fantasy, you know, which is just sort of to me, a kind of right-wing mirror of Marxism, this idea that there's this kind of perfect, perfect community outside of the political realities we live with. And I also think that this um, scholarship idea, sorry to go on, is, is pretty unappealing. It's not that everybody has to go to college. It's not that everybody has to finish college. I'm certainly not against Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg dropping out to uh, pursue business ideas and you know exciting tech opportunities. But I'm not sure that people need a subsidy and encouragement to do this. I think we have plenty of this kind of entrepreneurial activity driving the economy as it is. Jacob, if you think you're against it, wait till you get a load of me. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, this guy has things like a Ferrari Spider, a $500,000 McLaren supercar. He's got uh, uh, an apartment in the Four Seasons in San Francisco, as you write in all this in your piece. And my favorite, a white jacketed butler. Okay. <laughs> uh, now, what would happen to this jackass if we took away the government and all of a sudden there were no cops? My guess is this is the first guy in an unbelievable panic. Oh, well, that, well that's certainly true. And, you know, but even more than that, I think we look, well, how did he make his money? He made his money on the Internet. And where did the Internet come from? The Internet didn't come from pure entrepreneurship. It was sponsored by the government. It, was, it wasn't Al Gore that invented it, but it was DARPA the Defense Department's Advanced Research Projects Agency that created the original Internet, that made all this innovation possible. And that's what I mean about this fantasy, this, this idea that everything bad comes from the government, everything good comes from entrepreneurship. And, of course, it's a mixed picture. And strong economies certainly benefit from government making investments in basic science and technology research. And, uh, you know, I find the hostility to that a little bit unexplicable, and also, you know, to be honest, just sort of radically selfish. I mean, here's a guy who has made billions of dollars, he's had every opportunity, everything has gone right for him. He has money now, he's looking to make some sort of impact with philanthropy, and does he look for some opportunity to help people who are less fortunate than him? 
Not really. I mean, he's looking for, uh, he's giving money to people who he hopes are going to be rich like him, you know, to give money to tech entrepreneurs. And to me, it's a kind of uh, failure of sympathy and a failure of kind of imagination. I, look, I, this guy is the modern day narcissist. I mean, I, I've never seen anyone this shockingly selfish, with the obvious exception of the Koch brothers. <laughs> but, but, but with a similar profile, you know, because they are the other most prominent extreme libertarians. I mean, the Koch brothers have been the big founders of the Cato Institute, which is the country's leading libertarian think tank foundation. And, uh, you know, they give their money to similar kinds of causes. They, fo they follow more of a Republican profile. You know, they give their supporting the Tea Party and Tea Party candidates. But if you look on the Cato... Institute website there, lo and behold, is a you know personal statement of philosophy by Peter Thiel. And what does he say? He says the country went wrong when we gave women the vote and passed Social Security. And at that point, he's decided that capitalism became uh, incompatible with democracy. That is, if you're going to give women the vote, they're going to want all sorts of touchy-feely social programs and helping poor people, and they're just going to interfere in the free market to the extent that you can't have a free economy. So take your pick, capitalism or democracy with women voting. And I guess he's picking uh, unbridled capitalism, democracy be damned. You know, you got to give him credit for this. He's at least more honest about it. You know, he, he's, you know we're going to have Noam Chomsky on the program in, a, in the next segment. And in some strange way, he agrees that capitalism and democracy are incompatible sometimes, a lot <laughs> of times, right? Uh, yeah, but he, I mean, predicts, he picks democracy, Thiel picks capitalism. Zank, no, that's very well, uh, well stated. I mean, libertarians are consistent. They have a coherent view of the world, like Marxists. I think they're in many ways like Marxists. But the way they view the world is make, makes sense on its own terms. It just doesn't have many points of contact with the world that exists. So when you make some argument that, well, you know, without financial regulation, without sufficient financial oversight, that's how we got this financial crisis. They have an argument, no, 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 in a perfect world where the government doesn't regulate anything, consumers know to beware, people don't, people are punished for all these mistakes, and all this actually happened because we had too much government regulation, not because we had not enough. And, you know, you can go down, you can, you can follow this logic, but at some point you just say, you know, not only are you living in a fantasy world, but you have a kind of immature world view. I mean, I think so many uh, libertarians are people who read Ayn Rand when they were teenagers, got excited about it. Of course, it's very compelling as literature, and it's an appealing idea when you're a teenager. But then they somehow, these are the people who never grew out of it. No, I agree with you completely. I mean, look, he's a child in 800 different ways. He uh, also wants to discover things that will allow him to be 1,000 years old. Okay, yeah, I know, I know. Okay, he's, just, he's so obs absorbed with himself it's unbelievable but but what I'm surprised by is obviously he's a bright guy bright enough to make all this money to do the right investments etc but he thinks the the last great period in America was the roaring 20s right before the crash and the depression how could he not see these obvious things how can he not see that we had the crash then we had the crash now the regulations once they're peeled away that that the people don't magically do, don't do the right things. I mean, your Marxism analogy is perfect because that. I, whenever I read Marxism, I was like, how can they possibly believe that people will magically do the right thing and not be greedy? That's crazy. Right. It's sort of in defiance of what we know about human nature at this point. And, exactly. Uh, how, how does he not see that? That's what I'm amazed by. How can you be so smart and so stupid at the same time? Well, I think people who are prodigies in some sense, I mean, to give kind of a sympathetic interpretation, you know, here's a guy who has a real talent, right? I mean, he's a talent for business, he's a talent for understanding technology or for starting companies, incredibly hard-driving guy. And in some sense, you know, it might not be that different from someone who's a chess prodigy or a piano prodigy. I mean, you become kind of emotionally stunted, intellectually stunted. I mean, you, you know, you excel in one area and you're, you know, you're retarded, not in a negative sense, but, I mean, just in the sense of being, you know, behind in other areas, often personal emotional areas of your life, your ability to sympathize with other people, you know, not to psychologize too much, but you have to hope that someone like that is still going to 
be open to growth opportunities. Look, Bill Gates is a terrific example of that. I mean, I don't think Bill Gates was ever kind of selfish in the way Peter Thiel was, but he was a guy who was totally focused on making money, growing his business, didn't give any money away for a long time. People said, hey, Bill Gates, you're the richest man in the world. When are you going to, you know, when are you going to think about helping others? And Gates said, I can't focus on that right now. But you know what? He eventually did, and he became, I think, the greatest philanthropist of our era and is now totally devoting all of that energy to figuring out how to, how to eliminate disease around the world, to, to treat people in the developing world like they're really equal to people in the developed world, which is a really radical idea. So I sort of hold out hope for someone like Peter Thiel that someday he may grow up a little bit. Yeah, uh, based on what you've written uh, about what he's done in the past, I'm not sure. I'd yeah, you're right. Hope. You're right. That, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm kidding myself. But, right, you know, right. but when he wants to change, I think we should uh, we should give him the opportunity. Uh, I I would love that. I'm I'm afraid he's not going to be able to get out of his bubble enough to to realize that. And for anybody listening out there, whatever you do, don't listen to Peter Thiel. Don't drop out of college. Okay. <laughs> and what he also can't get through his thick skull is some people go to college, they become accountants or they become a uh, hundred different professions. We're not all going to be uh, high-tech entrepreneurs, you know. Well, this is, you know, I mean, I think this is one of the things that's working in our country. I mean, this, we have a culture of, of of startup companies, of venture capital. The money's there. The people are there. The ideas are there. The environment is there in Silicon Valley and around other kind of tech hubs around the country. And you know, you look at a place. You know, you look at a lot of countries in in Western Europe in Italy or France, where they have very little of this kind of activity for a lot of reasons, for cultural reasons, for economic reasons. And you kind of say, all right, this is something America is doing right. And Peter Thiel looks at it and says, boy, this is a disaster. If we don't focus on figuring out how to get more money into this sector, you know, our country is going to fall apart. And you can screw these things up when they're working well. I mean, you know, when there's too much money chasing too few ideas or too few good ideas, you get a bubble. You get the kind of tech bubble we had in 1999, 2000 that can have devastating consequences for the rest of the economy. So I'm not sure that his analysis of the strengths and weaknesses of our economy is right either. Absolutely. Jacob Weisberg from Slate, editor of Slate. Everybody check out his article on Slate.com. Thank you so much for joining us.